Well, hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas. And you know what? We greatly appreciate you joining us today. And we have a fabulous show for you. Yeah, Renee, I've been looking forward to this lineup for a while. It's about a beautiful bird, the mm -hmm. birds, if you will, that we're going to be talking about, hummingbirds. We right. have um, uh, Mr. John Paul Peter. He is um, a lead naturalist out at the Woodland Station at Land Between the Lakes. And they've got an amazing hummingbird festival coming up. And um, he's going to be talking about how you can attract hummingbirds to your property um, and about the festival. And then we're going to have Laurie Thomas talking about a new program that's available out there, the Master Naturalist Program here in Kentucky. I'm so excited to hear that. And then we have Dr. Laura DeWald is going to be talking about the White Oak um, Tree Improvement and Genetics product, Project and how you can pitch in and be part of it. So thanks for being with us. If you're on Facebook, you can um, interact with us via the comment section. And if you're on Zoom, you can use the chat pod. But we are delighted to have you with us today. We are greatly delighted. And you know what, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. And we have Dr. Matt Springer um, yeah. here to, uh, to uh, introduce our first guest. Yeah, so Matt, Matt's been working with these folks for a while, and he's been a part of this. So Matt, I appreciate you making this connection. Well, yeah, this is um, this is actually one of my favorite events of the year, um, and I, I unfortunately because of COVID, we all missed it last year. Uh, but I did get to partake two years ago, and it it, it really is one of the best um, festivals I think for wildlife in the state of Kentucky. Um, and also, you know, John, uh, who's here with us, if he wants to fire up his video, uh, John is a is a incredible naturalist with a great knowledge base, and um, you know. It's, it's one of those things where you have a, uh, if you're in Western Kentucky, uh, the Woodland uh, Nature Station is an, an amazing resource and a great place to visit, especially if you have kids. And if you can catch one of John's talk, you're going to definitely learn something about wildlife and, and the environment uh, based on what he has up there in his head. Uh, so John, um, thanks for being here. If you can, uh, you know, bestow some of that wonderful knowledge that you have out there, um, on us on, on specifically hummingbirds today, but also, um, you know, talk a little bit about that great festival you have coming up this weekend. No problem. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, say hi to everybody out there. Um, I've got a particular fondness for uh, extension services. I worked uh, for a number of years for Iowa 4-H, about four years, and then another half a year for the Tennessee uh, extension services. So I've had a lot of um, time in, in your guys' department uh, working and educating the, the general public. Um, like Matt said, my name is John Pulpiter. I'm the lead naturalist here at the Woodlands Nature Station. I've been here oh, at Land Between Lakes for about 25 years. And if you've never been to Land Between Lakes, it's, it's a long peninsula between two large rivers. Uh, it's mainly eastern deciduous forest, and it's about 40 miles long. And the neat thing about Land Between Lakes that makes it kind of unusual that it is all one large uh, green corridor. And being next to the Mississippi Flyway, we have a lot of opportunities to bring in lots of different kinds of migrating um, birds and other wildlife. And one of those things that kind of passes through the lane between, especially in about the month of August, is uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So to kind of give you an idea of what happens every August, is this, this is a scene, what you're seeing right now at Land Between the Lakes. Um, we are near that Mississippi Flyway. A lot of these hummingbirds are following the river systems and they're, they're coming through this as kind of a stop. Just like you go down an interstate and you, you're getting hungry and you need a little bit of carbs. Well, these hummingbirds are stopping by our McDonald's and uh, we even have the red and the gold there. And they're coming here because they need to fuel up. What's going on during this migration, these ruby throats are filling up from about two grams. They only weigh about two grams during the summer months, two to three grams, and they're gonna double their weight to about seven grams. And if they don't get to six to seven grams, they may not make it across the Gulf of Mexico. So the only real species that we have breeding here at Land Between the Lakes is the ruby throated hummingbird. That's mainly the only species we have breeding in the entire Eastern United States. So if you're in Eastern Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, Southern Kentucky, Central, or, or far Western Kentucky, you're only gonna get the ruby throat hummingbird uh, that will breed here. Uh, it's, it's an Eastern species, it it's dominates our area. Uh, people often will say to you, you know, I saw a black hummingbird or I saw a blue hummingbird or I saw a red hummingbird. It's all the ruby throat hummingbird because the thing about hummingbirds, they, except for the birds of paradise of Papua New Guinea, 
ruby-throated hummingbirds and all the other 350 species of hummingbirds in the world uh, are have iridescent feathers. They have a lot of display coloration that they use in courtship. Um, they, their feathers have an iridescent quality to it. So depending on what lighting you see that hummingbird, they may appear in, in a different color. On each individual feather, there's like a little bit of a prism, like a little prism bubble that refracts the light and gives them those different kinds of color, gives them that, that uniqueness, that shininess that you often see with them. Uh, even though it kind of sometimes also looks like we have uh, different hummingbirds out there, there is some sexual dimorphism, which means the males and the females and even the juveniles look different than, than each other. The, they get the name ruby throated hummingbird because the males, the adult males, will have that bright red gorget underneath their chin. That is, that is an adult breeding male, and he is quite territorial. He can actually guard uh, about a, a quarter of an acre, which makes him a pretty tough little guy. He'll go after even larger birds trying to keep him out of his territory. The fiend, on the other hand, uh, tends to have, does not have the gorgeous, but more of the white belly. But one of the distinctive characteristics with her is that she has white dots on her tail. And you can kind of see it in this picture here. The juveniles, knowing that the male is quite territorial and aggressive, that defends those feeders, will try to look like mama. And so juvenile females and juvenile males look an awful lot like mom. And that way the male hummingbird can't really distinguish them as something that he wants to keep out of his territory. Uh, the only difference that you might see is sometimes at this time of year in August, if you find a hummingbird or see a hummingbird, the juvenile males will have just a little tint of red coloring on the middle of their chest, kind of like a little bit of chest hair in a, in a teenage boy is uh, what you'll we'll see on them. Otherwise than that, they're pretty hard to distinguish unless you have them in hand and you can look at a number of other features. Uh, hummingbirds are only found in the New World, so you're not gonna find them in Europe, you're not gonna find them in Australia, you're not gonna find them in, in Euro-Asia, no, no places out except for the New World. Most of them are gonna be found in Latin America with about 21 species found in North America and of course, once again, ruby throats only found. You know, I always like to talk a little bit about some of the unique things of why the ruby throat hummingbird is kind of, kind of fun. Uh, one, uh, it's the smallest bird that we have here in the Eastern United States. Um, they can flap their wings about 80 times per second. Now I want that to kind of sink in a little bit. Think about what you can do 80, 80 times per second. And what they're doing is they're, they're flapping their wings and they're not only just flapping their wings, but you know, a normal bird makes a figure eight when they flap their wing. And that get, gives them that thrust that they need to stay aloft. A ruby thread hummingbird will flap their wings 80 times per second, and by doing that, each flap will be a double figure eight. And that gives them the ability to hover because hummingbirds are one of the few birds that can actually uh, fly upside down, go backwards, uh, and just hover above a flower. And of course, they need that to be able to uh, drink the nectar out of, of many of the different flowers. So when you think about a hummingbird, most people think that's all they do is drink nectar, that they're only a nectar drinker. Actually, that's only about 20% of their diet. One of my favorite facts to tell people about hummingbirds is that 80% of their diet is insects. They're actually an insectivore. They're not necessarily a nectivore. They are an insectivore. And most of the insects they eat, small spiders, uh, gnats, midges, mosquitoes, noceums, a lot of those things, aphids, things that we don't like to have in our gardens, these guys are very good at being able to utilize that for protein and fuel. A couple of things that's cool, uh, I mentioned that they can flap their wings eight times per second. Uh, males, when they're doing their courtship dance, they do it about 200 times per second. If you ever got some hummingbird feeders out in the, in the springtime, maybe around the end of April, beginning of May, you'll see male hummingbirds going back and forth in the U shape, uh, back and forth in the yard uh, to attract the attention of the females. And at that time, they're flapping their wings 200 times per second. So double, they almost triple the amount of flapping that you see in normal flying. During this migration that you see right now in the month of August, which is the peak of the migration of the hummingbirds, uh, here in the nature station, we get close to 200 to 250 hummingbirds a day. We know this because we uh, participated in a study, a seven year study with a hummingbird study group that captured all the hummingbirds that we had 
uh, during the month of August. And they consistently found during that seven year time period that we would have between 200 to 250 hummingbirds a day. And with that, we had a number of nesting females in our backyard. And so we know that we have just generally a high population of hummingbirds uh, here at the Woodlands Nature Station. In fact, we've had several hummingbirds that have been banded about four times and many females that are getting up to the age of six years of age. Uh, we have records, not here at the Nature Station, of hummingbirds living as long as 12 years, but that's an extremely unusual number. So when I, you know, I usually do this program for a lot of libraries. It's, it's the five easy ways to track hummingbirds. And, um, you know, so I got some different points on, on each of these different steps. One of the first steps that the beginner can do is get a hummingbird feeder. I remember when I was a kid up in Iowa, I seen my first hummingbird when my grandma put a perky pet hummingbird feeder outside of her window and being amazed at these tiny little birds visiting the, the sugar feeder. Uh, of course, the main thing that's important about the feeder is that it has red on it. That's an attractive color for the hummingbird. Uh, yellow can also work, uh, orange, but red tends to be the bigger one. What you may notice the most important part about that feeder though, that I really try to illustrate with folks is the color of the nectar that we put in there, the sugar water. You'll notice that there is no coloration in that sugar water. We strongly discourage anybody from putting red food coloring into any kind of hummingbird feeders. It is not necessary to attract them and it can actually cause harm, possibly even premature death of the hummingbirds. They just aren't able to digest that red food coloring like our systems are able to do. Uh, also, they find that sometimes that red food coloring will get on their feathers and kind of damage uh, the feathers and makes it harder for them to be able to fly south. Uh, so all you need to do if you, if you want to get started is mix some very hot water. You can sometimes boil it if you want it to last longer and mix a mixture of four parts water, to one part uh, sugar. And that's just plain sugar. You don't need to add anything else. Uh, a lot of studies of, of hummingbirds in captivity have often shown some of these mineral and vitamin mixes. They just can't seem to get it right for the hummingbirds and cause, cause a lot of problems, maybe premature death. So frankly, just, just do the plain sugar water, no additives, uh, and you'll be successful in grabbing hummingbirds. You know, and they can get the rest of what they need from the flowers or the, uh, uh, the insects that they're going to eat along the way. One other thing that you may notice is that we prefer using glass jars when we pick these things. A lot of times if you pick plastic, uh, as you clean them, you'll scratch them. Plastic tends to collect a lot of mold and, and fungus and that makes the ferments, the sugar water a little too fast. And you wanna change that uh, uh, feeder about every two or three days during this hot time period. One of the best thing that you could do, and I'm a big follower of Douglas Ptolemy uh, from the University of Delaware about uh, native wildflowers. In, fr in fact, um, the Kentucky Extension Service is the main reason why the Woodlands Nature Station got involved with native wildflowers. Uh, the wildlife extension person, at, agent at the time, was Tom Barnes 20 years ago, and he got a, our first native garden started here. And since then, uh, we have about 250 native flowers and trees that you can find in land between lakes, and all of them tend to attract different kinds of pollinators, including hummingbirds. Native wildflowers are probably the most important thing that you can have in your yard to be able to track hummingbirds. Uh, it, and if you don't have native wild plants, they're not really gonna go to a lot of other things because they're not gonna get the needs that they have. Plus the insects that are so important for them may not recognize those non-native flowers. And uh, that means you reduce the amount of, of edible insects, particularly for other birds, native caterpillars that aren't so important. Shelter. Uh, so this is kind of weird. We don't build bird houses for, for hummingbirds, not cavity nesters. But you can have a number of places that are places where they can be safe, you know, when they're feeding. So some different kinds of shrubs near your feeder. Uh, you can have different kinds of trees that provide uh, a place for them to be able to nest. We often not encourage a lot of vines like trumpet creeper, for instance, or trumpet honeysuckle uh, for a good place for the hummingbirds not only to get food, but some sort of shelter. Water. Everything needs water and including hummingbirds. It's a little bit more difficult with a hummingbird. They don't necessarily always drink just from standing water, like from a bird bath, but they do like to drink a lot of times. You'll see a lot of hummingbird activity, especially when you have uh, a rain coming in. So you can actually put up a sprinkler, get a dripper, maybe a mister, and you encourage more hummingbird activity. 
once again, the most important thing though is if you are out there, uh, it's important to do a lot of, of care of your hummingbird feeds. You gotta kind of keep an eye on that because it is sugar water and it can go mad. You know, one of the big problems that happens this time of year, you're gonna get a lot of insects, a lot of ants, you're gonna get a lot of bees, a lot of wasps. One of the things that you can do to kind of counteract that is you can dilute the water a little bit. So you can do a five to one ratio of five parts water to one part sugar uh, to deter kind of wasps or ants. A lot of times if my, uh, you can get ant moats and those work for some types of species of ants. But one of the things that I always try to encourage is, you know, ants, when they try to find sugar water or try to find food, they use scent. They don't really use eyesight or some of the other uh, uh, senses. So you can simply just move the feeder 10 feet and it will discourage a lot of the ants. And once the ants refine the feeder, then you just move it to the original spot and it, you can go back and forth and that will help keep ants out of, out of your hummingbird feeder. I always have problems with squirrels and raccoons. Uh, I don't really have a good solution for that. A lot of times I just, I gotta give up and, and try to feed them another source of food. Uh, of course, you need to watch out for any kind of mold and bees that might be, be coming about. Try to get those flowers in there. They got bee guards now on many of the plastic flowers and that will help uh, be able to discourage that. So that's kind of just the scheme of being able to track a lot of hummingbirds. Of course, if you come to our, our hummingbird festival here at Miami Twin Lakes, which is hold always the first weekend of uh, the month of August, uh, you guys can uh, see a number of different demonstrations. We'll have hummingbird banding. Uh, we'll continue on that banding that we've been doing for 25 years, uh, gathering some of the information from uh, former state ornithologists. And we also use hummingbirds to be able to reach out to other people about a number of different subjects. So we will have uh, the, the people that get, tend to get excited about hummingbirds also get excited about bats and attracting bats to their backyard or monarch butterflies or maybe frogs and salamanders, um, pollinators. They, we're gonna have a native plant sale. Ironweed Nursery is gonna be there. Uh, one of the things I always get excited is that we're able to partner with uh, Matthew Springer and, and the Wildlife Extension, but also uh, Raul Villanueva. Uh, he often comes to some of our things. And then uh, the last few years, we've been inviting different master gardener groups to come. And this year and the years past, we have Lyon County Extension and Marshall County Extension doing a booth and kind of talking about their Master Gardener thing, uh, program, uh, and as well as helping us and getting excited and being part of the program. The theme of this year is the art of hummingbirds. Um, you know, it, the Hummingbird Festival kind of kicks off a whole month, so we are going to have a number of events all month long because the hummingbirds are this active all during this month of August. So a few other things is we have dinner with the hummingbirds where we have a catered meal uh, out there on the patio, hummingbirds buzzing around us. For the first time this year, we're gonna have hummingbird yoga. So you can go practice yoga out in the middle of all these hummingbirds buzzing around. And then we'll have a series of different kinds of programs that will teach people how to attract hummingbirds, but also uh, kind of learn a little bit more about the science of hummingbirds and, and how they are involved in our ecosystem. So I hope you guys get a chance to come out to our hummingbird festival. Uh, you know, it's the first major event that we've done since COVID. We're going to have to do a couple different things to kind of mitigate some of the, the current outbreak. But uh, we've got a number of different artists. We've got a number of different wildlife experts. And we've got a lot of hummingbirds that you can come out and see. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I love I love hum hummingbirds. So um, it was really neat seeing in them. But um, does Kentucky get other hummingbird species as well? So one of the neat things that we've been finding about banding hummingbirds is the that we will get migratory hummingbirds. Some scientists are finding about five percent of populations of say the rufous hummingbird and a few other species that you'll find out what's uh, will migrate during the winter months and live in Kentucky and other places in the Southeast. It's becoming more and more commonplace, as I, I guess, since we're having more and more mild winters due to climate change. And so Lamy Twinks is no different. Uh, we have documented uh, rufous hummingbirds, black gen hummingbirds. State of Kentucky itself, they have had a very unusual one. They had one sighting of a green violet ear hummingbird that was in the Cincinnati suburb area during the winter months. Uh, we have also recently last year, somebody in the Tennessee porch just south of Lane Between Lakes also got a Mexican violet ear. So we do get different kinds of hummingbirds here during 
those time periods. And you can actually, because these are more cold hardy species, species that are, tend to be found in more mountainous areas or like the rufus is found in Alaska, a Kentucky winter might not be that hard for it. And so you can actually do different kinds of mitigated figure things to encourage those hummingbirds to stick around all winter long. And they'll come back, they may come back each year. So if you don't take your feeders down, will they not migrate then? So the ruby throated hummingbirds are so, you know, they're wired to be able to migrate. You know, a lot of people, we get a lot of calls during the month of October. We usually see our last hummingbird around October 8th and 10th here at Lime Between Lakes. And so a lot of people are concerned about um, leaving their feeder up and the hummingbirds won't leave. If you leave your feeders up, maybe just and take care of it for maybe a few more weeks, maybe a month, you can actually help some of those stragglers make it all the way to the Gulf Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. They are going to be hardwired to migrate to the Yucatan Peninsula. So you're not going to keep a hummingbird here. The only way that you're going to keep a ruby throat here is if it has an injury. It's not able to be able to fly that long. Mm -hmm. Some things like the root, you might encourage a rufus or a black chin to be able to stay here. But once again, those are a little bit more cold hardy species. So it's not that big of a deal. And they, if it gets too cold, they'll move on themselves. That, that is so helpful, John, because, yeah, I guess I was under that that thought, too, that, you know, I don't want to hurt the birds that make them stick around. And it, yeah, so that's really helpful for people to know. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more common questions that we get uh, here. And and uh, we, we, you know, we each year we try to encourage, we'd like to see a rufus or a black tin in our backyard. We've never had one. So we leave our feeders up about the middle of November or so. And uh, we still haven't had a winter hummingbird yet, but none of the ruby throats have stayed around. Okay. So uh, to go along with what John was saying there, in, in, the, in the text chat box there, I threw a, a website link to basically a hummingbird migration tracker website for all the species that people can, when they first see hummingbirds, uh, actually, you know, monitor their, their, their migration north, which works really well for our hummingbirds. Um, and it's, it's kind of neat to watch uh, in, in April and May as they start working their way up and through. So did they always come to Land Between the Lakes or did, it, did they kind of learn that pattern or? So, um, you know, it, it's hard to say, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, there is some learning involved in, in the hummingbirds that you see there because we've been doing hummingbird feeders and our native gardens mm -hmm. for about, you know, 25 27 years or so and 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 they're probably finding that this is a reliable food source now when we're doing the banding we are having a high recapture rate uh, which shows that we have a, a, a higher than normal uh, female nesting in the area and that's probably because we have a lot of resources that they're able to depend upon uh, from year to year mm -hmm. uh, but Lane between lakes itself is perfect prime hummingbird habitat you know it's an easy deciduous forest has all the right types of flowers for them that are specifically adapted for hummingbirds. As I mentioned, trumpet creeper, crossvine, uh, honeysuckle, columbine uh, are all some of the, the ones that are, tend to be a little bit more pollinated by hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have a lot of edge habitat, and that's another thing that hummingbirds like is they like a lot of edge. So when you come around Lime 20, you see you know that that forest ends in, with a lot of edge. So um, being along the Mississippi Flyway helps a lot. I, you know, we do have a high capture. I want to say in some years, we've had a high recapture rate of about 35%, hmm. uh, if I remember right, which is, is pretty pretty amazing. So hummingbirds are talking to each other then, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Other, hey, this is the spot to get you. Yeah, out. come check it out. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, we, you know, you, word of mouth, you know, good restaurant. Right? <laughs> yeah. exactly. You got a free oh. restaurant going around here. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the fact that you actually have events where hummingbirds will just come and fly around you. And that would be really neat um, to see. We greatly appreciate you uh, telling us about this because yes. I think it'd be a really thing, really cool thing to look at. No problem. And, you know, it, it, like I said, hummingbirds are going to be here all month. Hummingbird Festival is a is the first big thing that we offer. Um, and you know, if you want to get some plants that you know um, attract hummingbirds, you want to learn a little bit more about some of the other wildlife species that you're going to attract to your backyard, this is the festival for you. All right. Well, we hope you have a great turnout and it goes great. And and again, John, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and um, enlightening us and um, helping connect people to nature. So thank you. No problem, Billy. Thank you so much. And thanks, Renee and Matt. Thanks. Take care. Yeah.
All right. So very we're... good. Yeah, that was cool. Very yeah, cool. That was really cool. So now moving on to another cool program. Lori, yes. let's talk about the program you all are, are starting up. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share a screen here, but I wanted to just kind of give a little bit of an update on what's going on with the Kentucky Master Naturalist Program. And I know many of you all on here of our extension personnel have participated this past spring in the spring cohort and I um, wanted to let you all know that we're offering a uh, another cohort this fall and um, it's a 16 part online session so this is for maybe some extension personnel that didn't get to participate this past spring but it's also open to the general public so please for you extension um, people share this with the constituents in your county let them know about this program especially if you've gone through it you can really give them a firsthand um, example and experience of what it was like. But for those of you who do not know what the Kentucky Master Naturalist is, is it is a training that will address a range of topics in, that are related to the natural world. Those include the ecoregions of Kentucky, geology, soils, water resources, wildlife, entomology, archaeology, and lots more. So you get to learn a lot and it, you do it in one hour session. So it's a lot of, it's easy to do and you can do it from anywhere, sitting at your computer at home or at your computer at work. We will have Zoom classes um, every Friday in the fall and I'll give you dates here in a minute, but we're also gonna have some field classes that will be offered in this winter and spring that are gonna complement some of the classes that we're doing um, via Zoom. And if you wanna find out more about the Master Naturalist program, you can go to, the, you can see the website there, it's naturalist.ca.uky.edu. And the registration for this will be should be up there soon. Um, so these webinars will be offered live Fridays, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Central time. And um, they start September 3rd. They will be every Friday, September 3rd through December 17th. Um, and if for some reason that time doesn't work for you or you miss one, we record all of these and we post them on our website so you can go back and watch the ones you missed. And so if it didn't quite work with your schedule, you're not going to miss anything. Um, registration for the series is $100, um, but scholarships are available if you need assistance um, with those. And then I wanted to mention, um, for those that went through our Master Naturalist series, our cohort this spring, we had 72 extension personnel graduate as Master Naturalist, and we're offering some continuing education hours. And even if you haven't participated in it, um, or you haven't finished your Master Naturalist training, please join us for, um, we're doing a summer Zoom series. And these will be the next, starting this Friday through the 27th of August. They are free, um, but you do need to register at, um, here's the link there. It's also up on our website as well, where you can register for these webinars. Um, in August 6th, this Friday, we have BATS um, with Greg Janos from Copperhead Consulting. That one ought to be great. Um, August 13th, we're going to learn about prescribed fire with Josh Lillipop from the um, Kentucky Nature Preserves. August 20th, Mushrooms, and um, Megan Bulin here at the University of Kentucky. She's going to talk about fantastic fungi. And then Friday, we'll, um, the 27th, we'll wrap it up with Lichens with Kendall McDonald at the Kentucky Na Nature Preserves. It's a great program. I've seen Kendall do this one several times, and it's very, very interesting. So if you've gone through the original core training, please join us. These will be some good continuing education hours. If you haven't finished the core training or didn't go through it, join us anyway. This is a lot of great information. It's all via Zoom. These are also up in CURS and you get one credit hour. Um, if you So make sure if you do register that you go to, in your extension that you do go into CURS and register there as well. And then I wanted to, the last one I wanted to mention was we have some field days coming up, Kentucky Master Naturalist field days. And these have actually been put together by Master Kentucky Master Naturalist. Um, so this is a great way to get out and learn more in depth in person some of the stuff you learned in your Zoom trainings um, this past spring. Uh, the first one is August 31st, and it is Explore the Elkhorn at Canoe, Kentucky, and it's being led by Blake Newton, our entomologist, and Eric Comley, our 4-H agent, our 4-H agent and um, plant extraordinaire person in um, Garrett County. The cost for this is $40 and registration is limited. Um, if you would like to register for this, you just need to call Renee Williams at 859-257-7597. Seven five nine seven. These flyers are also up on our website as well, in case you didn't remember that. 
And then the second one is um, Cook Wild Field Day at Robinson Forest in Clayhole, Kentucky. So if you want to know more about Cook Wild program, you want to visit Robinson Forest, this is a great opportunity. And this great field trip has been put together by Martha Yaunt, Jan Nappage, Ashley Osborne, Stacy White, and Matt Springer. Um, the cost for this one is $20, but lunch is included and spots are limited. Again, if you'd like to register for this, you just need to call Renee at 859-257-7597. So we got a lot of great things um, uh, coming up with the Master Naturalist program, and I hope that some of you all can join us for the Zoom trainings um, and for the in-person field trips. And please share with your constituents in the county about this, the fall training series for a new cohort of Master Naturalists. If you have any questions, please email myself or Dr. Ellen Crocker, and we'll be happy to, to share whatever information and be looking, like I said, for the registration for the Master Naturalist fall cohort and very soon up on our website. Great, so thanks, great. you guys. I appreciate it. We did have a question. It said, uh -huh. what kind of background or prior knowledge is necessary to be helpful to, in, to enroll in the Master Naturalist program? Absolutely none. If you have an interest in the natural world, you want to know more about it, this program is for you. So we, it is a nice general um, program that covers all different aspects of our natural world and there's no previous knowledge is necessary. Okay. Laura, you all are doing really a great job with that program. And, um, you know, like we heard earlier with John, you all are connecting people with nature. And uh, thank you so much. I know it's a lot of fun. I've got to see some of those sessions and you all are doing a great job. Yeah. And I was going to say, I know Dr. Laura DeWald is going to talk about acorn collection next. So for those of you who have gone through the Master Naturalist program, you're looking for some volunteer hours, um, listen to Dr. DeWald next. This is a great opportunity to get some volunteer hours. We've got some other questions that have rolled in. So uh, what other gain knowledge, uh, what are the benefits of graduating from the program besides gaining knowledge? Uh, really, that's one of them and becoming a volunteer. So you now are going to be connected with na other natural areas and other volunteers that are doing things to be good stewards of our of our natural world. So you're gaining knowledge, but you're also contributing back to our being a good steward of our natural world. So that's a great benefit. We all want to be a part of making a change and making this world great. So yeah, and then awesome. I see there's another one. Do you have to be a part of the Master Naturalist program? No, you do not. Um, if you're interested, please join us. Just want to sign up at those links. Um, we're happy to have you. They ought to be a lot of, a, very interesting and a lot of fun. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Lori. We greatly yeah. appreciate that. I appreciate it. Yeah, good work. Good work. Oh, so, speak, speaking of good work. <laughs> good work and working out in nature. Uh, <laughs> We have Dr. DeWalt here to talk a little bit about some work you can do in nature if you'd like. <laughs> Great. All right. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the White Oak program. Some of you already know about it. Some of you are new to it. So we'll do a quick little review and then I'll talk about um, an opportunity that um, folks can help me with uh, with the project. Um, one of the big activities that's going to happen this fall is um, our acorn collecting effort. And just to give everyone a little bit of background, um, the program, we call it Walk Tip, um, what is a big collaborative project. Um, it was developed at the University of Kentucky to support White Oak Forest management efforts. That, um, and the way we support those efforts is by developing improved White Oak. And the goal here is that we're trying to get White Oak seedlings that our state nurseries can sell that will be more competitive when we plant them into the natural forest. So right now we have a lot of seedling regeneration, but that, that regeneration is having a really hard time growing up through and becoming those big, can beautiful canopy trees that we need. So the idea here is that if we can get a faster growing, healthier, stronger, more vigorous seedling, um, it will be able to compete. And you can see there in the picture the one on these two are these are ten year old white oak seedlings, um, sapling trees, ten whatever you want to call them. At any rate, um, the one on the left, the nursery manager there, he just went out to two nice looking white oak trees and he he did a control breeding and he collected the acorns and he planted them in the nursery. And then um, the one on the right, those are from most state nurseries rely on seeds sold to them. And so the acorns that were, so, white oak acorns that were sold to the nursery, he just grabbed a handful of those and planted them beside his, his um, 
control pollinated ones and then they were grown side by side at the nursery. He planted them um, on the same site on the nursery. And this is what they look like 10 years later. And, and I think it's pretty obvious that that one on the left there, that improved one would be the one we want. That, that one's gonna be able to compete in the forest. I mean, just look at the crown area, the leaf area. Whereas that one on the right is, is probably not gonna be able to outcompete things like red maple and tulip poplar. And, um, but sadly, if that's what's coming in from the forest to the nurseries to sell, uh, that's what we're getting. And so our goal is to, to turn this around. So we've got three steps or three phases to the program. Um, the first step is to get acorns and we're trying to get it from the entire range of white oak. And then those seedlings are grown at the Kentucky Division of Forestry's Morgan County Nurseries. We transplant the seedlings into progeny tests. And we do that because we wanna see how good was that parent? Is it able to pass along good genetics? And then we use the progeny test results to select parents that produced really good offspring. So it's all about the parents actually. And then um, we use those, then we go back to the parents and we clone them and we use those to create a graft, what we call a grafted seed orchard. And the purpose of the seed orchard then, it's gonna you have a bunch of different um, high quality parents that are mixing pollen and those acorns from those trees then, but that's what's going to produce those superior white oak seedlings for the nurseries to sell. So this is the big deal here. Um, the past two years has not been a very good uh, mast or acorn production year, but it's looking like knock on wood, nothing crazy happens with the weather. <laughs> um, but so far, so good. It looks really, really good. So our goal is we want to try to get acorn collections from one or two trees per county per state where white oak occurs naturally. So we don't really want planted white oaks um, because we want oaks that have evolved and, and that nature selected for and are best in tune with their environment. And to do this, if you look at that huge green area on the map, that's where white oak occurs. There's no way I could run around and do this all myself. And so um, the white oak project is collaborative and this is one of the ways in which it is collaborative. We rely on many, many kinds of volunteers. We've got uh, federal and state agencies, so like the Forest Service and Kentucky Division of Forestry. Um, but I'll tell you what, the Master Naturalist Program has contributed probably more than any other group to the acorn collecting effort. They are fantastic. Um, every state that has a Master Naturalist Program in it has had volunteers go out and collect acorns. And um, I, I love my master naturalists who are collecting acorns for me. They they work really hard at it. You know, some of them. Uh, one of the questions was about prior knowledge. You know, some of these master naturalists are just learning what a white oak, white oak is. Others already know. It's uh, no big deal. There's all kinds of learning that goes into this, and um, they they're just amazing. I the the program would not be as far along as it is without the master naturalist program. So. Um, this is a great way to volunteer. And, you know, a question had just come up to uh, Lori in terms of, you know, what do you get out of the program? Well, let me tell you from someone who relies on Matron National is what I get out of the program. You know, here's a project that needed, it's a huge geographic scale. And when I was trying to figure out, well, gosh, you know, how can I achieve this? You know, the master naturalist was a perfect organization for me to, to do this because there's usually a coordinator in every state, that coordinator, and then there's often chapters in different states, depending on how it's organized. They send out a call and, and I, I didn't have to do anything. I was able to just sit back and wait for the volunteers to collect me. And they're like, hey, I've got a white oak in my yard, or hey, I know I've got a white, you know, I know where there's a really beautiful white oak. And, and then we, we just get the whole collection thing going. Um, I have had distilleries have also contributed um, because of COVID, not as much academic um, from like forestry programs or natural resource programs, but I'm, I'm hoping this year um, that they will jump in and help. We also have, uh, NGOs like the Nature Conservancy. Um, I might ask John from the Nature Center, see if they'll uh, do an acorn collection from be Land Between the Lakes. I actually don't have um, any acorns from there. And, and woodland owners have also chipped in. Now, 
we have several gaps, including most of the southern states. And this is really critical because part of this whole project is we will be moving seed from south to north to see how it responds um, because we're trying to help the white oak out with climate change. So we really, really need those southern collections. And I know we're in Kentucky, but one of the really great things about the master naturalists is is they know somebody who knows somebody or they have cousins in another state or or, or all the extension folks that are on the um, that are viewing this today you know it's okay if you don't want to go collect acorns but if you have a, a you know a cousin grandparents children grandchildren um, that sort of word of mouth network has been really really great and that's where I've, I've been able to fill in um, gaps where I you know I, I don't know who to ask there just isn't anyone there and this is particularly important in states that don't have a master naturalist program so just to let you know where those acorns go once I get them. So as I said before, they're growing at the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And then when they're one year old, we outplant them. And so we're planting all of them um, at the Star Hill Farm, which is part of Maker's Mark Distillery in Loretto. And this is gonna allow us to look at how acorns, um, how those progeny from all over that green area on the map, how they perform. But super critical this fall is that what we want to do is establish regional progeny tests. So these are progeny tests that are specific for particular regions around the eastern United States, because how a, how a tree performs in Kentucky may not be relevant to how that same parent tree, how their offspring might perform in Wisconsin. So Wisconsin is putting in two tests, for example, they're putting one on the very northern edge of, of the current white oak range, and then they're putting one kind of in their central. And those collections are going to include Wisconsin, a little bit around Wisconsin, and then we're going to move some up from Tennessee. We're going to put some from Tennessee up in Wisconsin again, just to see how all that works. The little flurry of stars over there in the Northeast is really cool. Um, we're actually part of a very large urban and community forestry project. And they contacted me about getting white oak seedlings. And I was like, hmm, how about if um, we include a, um, a progeny test? And so we have progeny tests actually going into the city of Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, New York City, and Springfield. And so it's, it's really cool. So actually looking at, at how different seed sources will perform in an urban environment. So the more tests we get established all at one time, the better. And so since it looks like the acorn production this year is really good, I'm trying to push really, really hard this year to get it all those collections done. The mail deliverer at UK is going to hate me, but because uh, we get bulk kit boxes and boxes of acorns coming in. But this is a really critical fall. So the more folks I can get out there helping collect, um, the better, because that's what's going to help us get all this done. And in terms of um, connecting to educational programs, all of these regional progeny tests are are also there's a the new, whatever the nearest academic university program and natural resources is is actually also going to play a role. So we're directly involving students in helping us put these in and measuring the photo there at the bottom of your screen. Um, we actually have the forestry, UK forestry students in their spring camp were actually helped us plant the Maker's Mark site that you can see there in the photo. So the, the end goal here is that we need, we want higher quality seedlings than the nurseries currently are able to produce. So there's a couple different ways we're gonna do that. Once we have the progeny tests, the progeny tests are key, which is why there's that big push this year to get as many acorns from as many areas to populate those regional progeny tests. So we can go back to the parents and we can collect twigs and we can actually create a grafted um, seed orchard in the nurseries or on nursery land. And the cool thing about that is then the nurseries will not have to rely on purchasing acorns from folks where they, they don't know the quality of the trees those acorns came from. So there'll be a, basically a direct line of the seed orchards directly to the nursery, and then they'll be producing the seedlings. The demand for white oak seedlings is very high, and probably those grafted seed orchards won't be able to keep up. So there's a couple other different ways. Um, those regional progeny tests, once we get the data from them, which is as little as seven years, actually. So this is not like way into the future. This is pretty short term 
in terms of natural resource management goes. We can actually basically thin out the trees that didn't do well in those regional progeny tests. And then you just let them grow up and they start the, you know, all you, what you have left are the best performing trees that can pollinate each other and, and produce acorns that will produce high quality seedlings. And then finally, um, the Forest Service is interested in also creating seed production areas and uh, several uh, woodland owners have expressed some interest in wanting to participate. And so what we're looking at there is just having these little tiny seed production areas. We're working on a way that we could actually um, certify them as producing high quality um, acorns. And that way if the nursery is purchasing those, they know that what they're purchasing came from one of these um, high quality acorn production areas. So the process is really easy. Basically, you just need to go out and find a white oak. We are using tree snap um, because it takes a photo of the tree so I get to see what the tree looks like. But also really importantly, it automatically records the GPS coordinates of the tree. And that's really helpful because remember at some point we might wanna go back out if that tree produced really good offspring and we want it in that seed orchard, you know, we need to clone that tree. So we would actually come out with the landowner's permission and collect twigs and graft those twigs to create that seed orchard. So the tree snap is very helpful um, in doing all that for us. White oak, you don't need a climb or anything. In fact, with white oak, you gotta wait for those acorns to drop onto the ground. Um, if the squirrels throw them down, like you see in that green acorn, um, we don't collect those because those actually, they won't produce seedlings. Um, we can plant them, but they'll do nothing. So you basically wait until the tree is kind of raining acorns. Um, White oak is, is unique among many species because it is programmed to start to grow immediately when it hits the ground. So you can see there the little root coming out. That's totally fine. We hand plant these so you can collect um, acorns that have the roots coming out. We have folks do a float test. So acorns that float are no good for a variety of reasons. Usually a, a weevil, a native, it's a native organism gets in there and, and feeds on the, the acorn meat inside there. And so those are no good, but the ones that sink are. And so you just collect those and you keep collecting until you can fill up about a one gallon Ziploc bag. And then you send me an email and I will send you the postage and a mailing label to slap on that box and you just send it in. So um, that is what the process is. And I would be happy to entertain any questions. Laura, that is really neat what you've got going on. And there's so many opportunities for people to get engaged and involved. So we encourage all of our viewers to participate and um, help out. Definitely. So if you have um, any kind of, you can do an email address. Do you have an email address, Laura, that people could email you questions at? Yeah, and it's actually on the, that last slide that just was up there, but it's laura.dewald at uky.edu. So easy to remember. Right, definitely. All right, well, some good work going on. And so uh, we greatly appreciate you being on today. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Billy, I think that's all we had, even though it was a huge cram packed show, right? And we covered a lot of ground. You know, we learned some stuff about hummingbirds. You know, every time we do this show, Renee, I learn something. And I've been doing this stuff for a while, but there's just some great knowledge. Um, John Paul Peter, it was segment was great. Definitely. So I think, you know, I think that's the whole point of our show, right? To try to get knowledge out to people um, and even to us you know, <laughs> that we didn't know anything about. So we greatly appreciate it. And, you know, um, if you have any kind of show topic ideas at all, we are willing to take those. Um, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and we have a form there that you can fill out and we always take suggestions. We do. And, you know, it's a great reminder. This show is about you and the viewers. So we want to try to provide you all the content you're looking for and try to help you take care of our forests and natural resources. So thank you all for being with us every week. We really and speaking appreciate of content it. on that website. We have every show we've ever done except um, today's. <laughs> yeah. And people could spend weeks and weeks just watching our videos. So I have, yeah. they have been. <laughs> Some people yeah. have. So we greatly appreciate it because we couldn't do this without you all. Exactly. So, yeah. But so until then, take care and we will see you next week at 11. Right. Bye. Bye everyone.